Today's Something You Should Know podcast is sponsored by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. There are thousands of books to choose from for your free download, including the book discussed on today's podcast. Get your free audiobook download and 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K, which stands for Something You Should Know. AudibleTrial.com slash S-Y-S-K Today on Something You Should Know, you've probably received a million variations on the Nigerian Prince scam email. You know where some royalty in Nigeria wants to give you $10 million? This scam is more effective today than ever. How can that be? Plus, market category design. Have you heard of this? It's what legendary entrepreneurs do to achieve big success. When you're marketing, you're fighting for share in an existing space. What these legends do is they create their own categories. And they drive you and I to think about things the way they do. And when we do that, we stop doing what we used to do, drive to Blockbuster, and we start doing something new, log on to Netflix. That's Chris Lockhead, co-author of the new book, Play Bigger, and he is coming up. Plus, you know the advice your mother gave you to just be yourself? Well, that may be some of the worst advice you ever got. All this today on Something You Should Know. Something you should know. Fascinating intel. The world's top experts and practical advice you can use in your life today. The Something You Should Know podcast with Mike Carruthers. Every day I get, I don't know about you, but I get, I don't know how many junk emails that clearly are either scams or that, you know, they have attachments that, um, obviously have viruses in them that they want me to click. and uh, But my favorite of all of the junk emails and the scam emails that I see, my favorite is the <laughs> the Nigerian Prince email scam. I mean, how long has this been going on? <laughs> I mean, I've gotten this scam email m- zillions of times over the years, so you would think by now that everybody knows about it. Nobody could be falling for that scam email anymore. But while most people do know about it, it turns out that there are still some people who don't. And if they respond, they are more likely to become victims than ever before. The result is the scam is more effective today than ever before. And the scam is done in a way that all the emails are usually poorly written and they're in broken English. And that's done on purpose because if somebody still responds after, A, not knowing that it's a scam in the first place, and B, reading it in broken and lousy English, and they still respond? Well, now they're really likely to fall for the whole scam. The best course of action, of course, is to just ignore and discard the emails. However, there's a guy named Cormac Hurley, and he wrote an entire research paper on the Nigerian email scam for Microsoft, And his suggestion is that if you have the time, play along and scam the scammers and waste as much of their time as you possibly can. If you're messing with them, then they have less time to scam real victims. Just make sure you use an anonymous email address when you correspond with them. Otherwise, you'll get scam emails for every adult product (laughs) In the world for the next 20 years. There's actually a TED Talk video you can watch to see what happened when this comedian, his name is James Veach, I believe it is, uh, engaged with the scammers and pretended to go along with them. And it is hilarious to watch this video. All you have to do is uh, Google James Veach, V-E-I-T-C-H, James Veach email scam, and the video will come up at the top of the, the Google search. And that is something you should know. There are successful entrepreneurs, and then there are the super successful entrepreneurs. Think Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, and the usual list of super-duper entrepreneur suspects. So what separates the good ones from these great ones? Well, in many cases, it is something called market category design. It's really quite fascinating, and here to discuss it is Christopher Lockhead. He is one of the authors of a new book 
called Play Bigger, which is the result of some serious research on the topic. Hi, Christopher. Welcome. Excellent. Well, it's my pleasure to be here, Mike. So explain what category market design is and where it comes from. Traditionally, innovators, when they come up with something new that they want to unleash on the world, uh, traditionally they do two things. They build what they hope is a legendary product and a legendary company to deliver that product, and they launch it into the world. And they hope that the world sort of figures it out, that they understand this innovation. And what we discovered is the greatest innovators and entrepreneurs over time don't do just two things. They do a third thing, which is they design a product company and a market category. And so by doing that third thing, they materially increase the likelihood that they're going to succeed. And so ultimately, that's what it is to play bigger. And who do we know that we would know does this? Uh, So a great example would be somebody like uh, Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook. Uh, As you may know, there were many social networks uh, at the time that Facebook launched, and uh, today there's only one. And so the question is, why did Facebook win where MySpace and uh, Tribe and, and so many others failed? And the reason for it is the magic combination, we call it the magic triangle of all three of those things, right product, right company, and right market category. And specifically, Zuckerberg taught us to accept the definition of what a social network should be that was in alignment with his point of view. And when we accepted his point of view, we all logged on to Facebook and forgot about MySpace. And that's really what legendary innovators do. They design a category by teaching you and I to think about a problem and a solution the way they do. And if we accept their point of view, then ta-da, a new market emerges. Do you think that's deliberate? I mean, did Mark Zuckerberg sit down and think, well, now I've got to teach people about my market category? Or is this Monday morning quarterbacking and saying, oh, see what he did? By accident, he just kind of stumbled into this. Well, certainly some entrepreneurs and innovators Uh, stumble into it by accident. Um, If you had asked Zuckerberg at the time, are you doing category design? Uh, Of course, he probably would have said no. He he might not know what category design is. But what what we discovered is that the legendary entrepreneurs have a natural intuition about the market. Uh, Jobs, Steve Jobs was another great example, where they understood that for their innovation to take flight, the world needed to see things the way they did. So, for example, in 2001, Bill Gates launched the tablet PC. And he did what most entrepreneurs do, which is they say, hey, look, isn't this a cool new product or technology? And they have essentially a features discussion with the world. And if the world connects the dots between those features, a benefit, and most importantly, a problem that they want solved, then they buy the product. The problem, however, is that more often than not, the world doesn't connect those dots as they didn't in 2001. And then in 2009, when Jobs launched uh, the iPad, which was another tablet computer, he did something different. He stood on stage and he said, we believe there's room for a third category of device. And now let me tell you why. And he shared his point of view about why there was a problem that wasn't being solved by a laptop or a smartphone that needed to be solved by a tablet. And when you and I accepted his definition, his point of view, we all stood in line to buy uh, iPads in a way that we didn't when uh, Gates did a similar thing, but he didn't condition the market to think about it in a new way. Even though the iPad and the Microsoft tablet more or less did the same things. Exactly. And you could argue that the iPad was a better product, and maybe it is and maybe it isn't, but essentially designed to do a very similar thing and solve a very similar problem. However, the world didn't understand why it needed a tablet PC uh, in, in a, because Gates didn't teach us and Jobs did. And so what many entrepreneurs forget is that in order to buy a solution, the world needs to relate to and understand a problem. And interestingly enough, once you and I as consumers get what the problem is, we rush to the solution. Yeah, well, that's interesting. So 
if in fact people are are conditioning the market, that's really a marketing strategy. It's not so much about the product; it's about how you condition your buyer. Exactly, Mike. And the thing that is unique, however, from traditional marketing, uh, marketers have to understand that in order to do marketing, a market must exist. So if it's an existing market, by definition, it was designed by someone else. And so if we're launching a product or service into an existing market that was designed and created by someone else, we're at a disadvantage. In the research for our book, Play Bigger, we did an analysis of every venture-backed technology company founded in the United States since 2000. And we asked the following. We asked, what percentage of market cap goes to the leader, the category king? That is to say, what percentage of the total value in the market goes to the leader? And what we discovered is that number 76%. So in the technology industry, it's a winner-take-all game with the leader getting two-thirds of the economics. And so the question is, how do you become that leader? And what we discovered is the way that legendary entrepreneurs, Benioff uh, at, at, at Salesforce.com, Jobs and, and Zuckerberg, who we've talked about, Reed Hastings, the founder of Netflix, what these legendary entrepreneurs do is something different than just marketing. When you're marketing, whether you realize it or not, you're fighting for share in an existing space. What these legends do is they create their own category. They create the market itself, and they drive you and I to think about things the way they do. And when we do that, we stop doing what we used to do, drive to Blockbuster, and we start doing something new, log on to uh, Netflix. And what Reed Hastings didn't do was say to the world, we've got a better a blockbuster. He said, we have something different, something unique. Yeah, but, but what if you're wrong? I mean, I imagine a lot of people create categories that suck. <laughs> that, that, <you> know, <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, they do. And, and those categories don't go anywhere. And um, of course, you can be wrong. The question, however, is if you're entering an existing space, um, particularly in the technology industry, we know you're fighting for 25% of the market. And so by definition, you're setting yourself up to fail. So yes, category design can fail, i.e. the category never takes off. But what's worse, failing in a category that you tried to dominate as your own or starting off knowing at best you're going to get 25% uh, of the market cap of the space. But what, do you, what is it that these guys have, what is it that they know that makes it likely that people will buy into this? I mean, or, or do, is it the case where before Steve Jobs talked about his new category for the iPad, he bombed at a bunch of other things? And it's just luck of the draw that eventually he threw enough stuff on the wall and something stuck. Well, luck plays, of, of course, uh, an imp has an impact in everything. But if you look at the career of a Jobs, uh, clearly it was more than just luck. And so what we discovered in our research was that the legendary entrepreneurs have a natural intuition about how to teach you and I to look at something differently. And I use different on purpose. So, um, uh, for example, Sarah Blakely, who's the founder of Spanx, when she created Spanx, which is now a multi-billion dollar value company, she didn't say this is underwear 2.0. She said it's a new category called shapewear. And when, in this case, women understood the problem that shapewear solves, which is to make you look good under tight-fitting clothing, and how that's distinct from lingerie or uh, other forms of underwear, the market got it, and pow, Sarah created a billion-dollar-plus company uh, out of thin air. But the reason she created that was the market understood why, and I'm going to use this word on purpose, shapewear was different from traditional underwear. And that's really the thing that legendary entrepreneurs do. The conversation they have with the, with the marketplace is predicated on a unique point of view, which is predicated on an insight, and then they explain to us why their, prob their product is different 
than what came before. And you and I understand and relate to different, better than what most entrepreneurs do, which is they scream, look at my new carbodingulator. It's better than what came before. And, you know, the people at Pepsi have proven to us that you can scream better for a hundred years and the world doesn't believe you because Coke is still the leader. And the reason Coke is still the leader is because you and I accept Coke as the company that was the category designer, if you will, of what uh, cola soda should be. The question I often have when I hear explanations like this, where it's always Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, the Spanx lady is, is as you say, these are legendary entrepreneurs and most of us, by definition, are not going to be legendary entrepreneurs. And so then I wonder, is there really something here to, to, to emulate, or is this really something in their DNA to marvel at, but good luck trying to do it yourself? <laughs> exactly. It's like, well, uh, you know, I enjoy playing basketball, but uh, I'm not going to be Steph Curry. Um, exactly. That's the question, Mike, that we have spent the better part of our lives trying to analyze and understand. And many of us, myself included, do not have the natural market intuition to understand product category and company the way a Jobs did. However, what we have tried to do is say, okay, let's try to unpack what these legends did intuitively or, if you will, implicitly and learn how you and I can do it explicitly. And so... The work of Play Bigger, the book, is really exactly that. We did uh, over 100 interviews. We did uh, three-quarters of a million dollars in data science research to to understand exactly the question that you ask and to break down what are the things that the legends did intuitively that you and I can learn and take and apply to our own businesses. And ultimately, that's what this new management discipline category design is all about. Let me pause here, and when we come back, I want to ask whether or not we're really talking about, as interesting as this is, we're really talking about just a handful of businesses that can pull this off, because most businesses today are in a category that already exists and kind of need to be in that category, and they're really not in a position to create a new category. Well, anyway, first, let me talk about audible.com. If you have yet to try listening to an audiobook, now this is really, this is something you've got to do. And with audible.com, you can get a free book download and a 30 day free trial to their service with no obligation. You can choose from their thousands of titles. I mean, I think it's like 200,000 titles of books. And if you're enjoying this conversation, you can get Chris Lockhead's book. Play Bigger as your free download book and save yourself $20. Just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K to get your free download of any book you like and your 30-day trial membership. There's no cost. audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. That stands for something you should know, so they'll know who sent you there. audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K. I'm speaking with Christopher Lockhead. He is one of the authors of the new best-selling book, Play Bigger. And we're talking about how super successful businesses don't fight for market share in an existing category. They create their own category. And my question is, isn't it true that most businesses can't really do that? I mean, if you're a dry cleaner, you're a dry cleaner. I mean, you can, you can call it something else and pretend it's in another category, but when people want their clothes dry cleaned, they go to a dry cleaner, right? Well, maybe yes, maybe no. It turns out that small businesses can do category design as well. Uh, one of my personal favorite examples is there's a, there's a famous deli in Montreal where I grew up called Walensky's, created by uh, the patriarch of the family who's now no longer with us, Mo Walensky. His family continues the tradition to this day. It's a small local deli, and they make what a lot of people would call a bologna sandwich. Um, And on a Wednesday afternoon in February, when it's really cold in Montreal, there's a long line out the door to get a Walensky special. And you could argue part of it is the product. People love the sandwich. But more importantly, Mo and his family, over time, created a distinct position in the world with a one-location, unique deli that delivers a completely different experience. And so, 
you could open a generic deli and just say all the same things and do all the same things that everybody else does. Or in the case of Walensky's, you can create a category of one. And when the world understands uh, why your sandwich is different than everyone else's, they'll line up. And so it's even possible for a small local business, an individual contributor, or even you and I in our own careers to distinguish ourselves in a way that we stand out and we, if you will, create a category of one that only we can fulfill. And whether that's you and your personal career or a small local deli like Winsky's or ultimately Facebook, Uber, Salesforce.com, the principles of how you stand out around solving a problem, evangelizing that problem, and having the world understand why solving that problem makes a difference, those, that thinking that underlies the strategies behind category design applies to an individual, a small business, or someone who's aspiring to be the next Steve Jobs. People buy things, though, not because they're different, but because they serve a purpose, right? Well, yes, but if the things that existed today served the same purpose, there would, be, there would be no need for the new thing. And so what causes you and I, Mike, to say, oh, this new product serves an important purpose is when we understand how it's different and how it can solve a problem that we know we have or a problem that we didn't know that we had in a, in a uh, compelling way such that we gravitate towards it. Yeah. Okay. But then who has to come up with the problem? I mean, in, in other words, does the, the person creating the category say, here's this new category and here's the problem that this solves, or here's the new category and now you guys figure out which problem of yours this will solve and see if it doesn't work? The, the greatest category designs are mu- uh, designers are much more explicit about it. So, uh, for example, Henry Ford, when he launches the automobile... Um, he doesn't call it the automobile. He doesn't evangelize its features. He calls it the horseless carriage. So he's describing it by what it's not in the context of what the market already understands. And he begins to evangelize the power of a carriage without a horse. And it's only when you and I understand that that we can accept the notion of an automobile. And so... Uh, we like to say, Mike, the greater the innovation, the more the market education. It's, in, in hindsight, you would think, well, of course the market would gravitate towards the horseless carriage. But as we know, uh, less than 2% of startups in our country are ever successful. And roughly 50% of the Fortune 500 turns over every, every uh, 20 to 25 years. And the reason is companies fail to have their innovations or new products adopted in the market. And the reason for that is the market doesn't understand how they're meaningfully different from what came before. And that's really where category design begins to play. It's, it's category design, if, if you will, gets the market to come to you. Most companies have what they call a go-to market strategy. Category design is an approach for getting the market to come to you and to create pull where none existed before. And how much different does the new category have to be for people to see it as a new category? Can it just be a little different, or does it have to be, is it black or white, all or nothing? The world has to believe it's meaningfully different. You can have an argument about whether or not it is or it isn't from a quote-unquote reality point of view, but as you know, perception becomes reality. So is a tablet that much different than a smartphone? You can have a technical feature-oriented discussion about that, but you and I and the world recognized it as a distinct innovation solving a distinct problem that created a whole new market category. So the ultimate test is, does the world agree with you that it's different? And, you know, sometimes you can build a billion-dollar business around a very small difference, and it's a matter of whether or not that the world accepts that difference as important and valuable. And that's ultimately the job of the category designer. But is there a concern here that when you try to deconstruct after the fact that somebody's done this, that it's it's kind of like, you know, a famous chef makes his soup and then you try to pick it apart and figure out how he makes it, but you never quite really get it because you can't, because he is who he is. He's 
in your in in this discussion, it's Steve Jobs, it's Mark Zuckerberg. Those people are who they are, and you you can try to deconstruct what they did, but the secret sauce is still going to be missing. Well, I'm not a doctor, but here's what I know: uh, when they do an autopsy on a human being, they don't find an organ in there called business talent or category design. <laughs> Um, so on one hand, Steve Jobs was no different than you and I. He was just a human being. On the other hand, it would certainly be irresponsible to say that uh, there wasn't something magic about him and about many of these entrepreneurs that we're talking about. The question is, um, if that's not a natural intuitive skill for you, is it something you can learn? So uh, I love to play guitar. I'm not Eddie Van Halen, and I'm certainly not Les Paul, the creator of, of, of the, the electric guitar. But if you sit me down and you're patient with me, you can teach me to play guitar, uh, even though my level of natural talent is different from a master, if you will. And so what category design is about is, is teaching those of us who are not necessarily intuitive what's really going on and, 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 and try to emulate it. The other interesting thing, Mike, that we found when we share this, because uh, category design is really like a, a secret black art that's been practiced in Silicon Valley for a long time that people were not explicit about. When we share it with some of these legends that we've been talking about, what they say is, wow, uh, you have, you have, I could never have explained this myself. I sort of, you know, Picasso can't tell you how he creates that painting. But when they, when they hear about it and when they read it in the book, what they realize is, ah, yes, of course that's what I was doing. And so if you're natural about it, then you're natural about it, and that's a, a great skill that you have. If you're not, um, you want to learn about it. But even the people who are natural about it, when they begin to study it, they get even better at it. And so category design is like anything. Even if you have a natural uh, capability, if you learn more about it, you're going to get better. If you practice it more, you're going to get better. And if you're somebody who wants to build a great business and you're may, maybe more naturally uh, a product-oriented person, then all, all the more reason you should study the category component of this. Yeah, great. Well, but, but aren't there plenty of business categories? You mentioned Coke and Pepsi. And yeah, Coke is number one, but Pepsi's done okay at number two, and, and, and Avis did okay at number two, and, and that, that there are plenty of categories where a little competition is just what's needed, and you may not be number one, but you'll do just fine. Yeah, and that, you certainly see that outside of the technology space. Tech is our uh, area of expertise, because the, the, all four of us uh, co-authors of Play Bigger come from the technology industry. What we know in the tech industry is what I mentioned earlier around the data science research we did. One company takes two-thirds of the economics, and that's not always true outside of the tech industry. However, if you start to look at the modern world, there's an eerie, uncanny, winner-take-all dynamic emerging in lots of markets. So, for example, uh, the company that created Five Hour Energy, Living Essentials, not only did they create a new product, they created it as a new category. They didn't call it uh, a soft drink. They didn't call it a sports drink. They called it an energy shot. And that market today is roughly a $2 billion category, and they are, they're a private company, so it's hard to know for sure. But if you read some of the industry reports, they have uh, somewhere around $1.8 billion of that market category that they created. And so... This winner-take-all dynamic that we see in the tech world is applying in more uh, industries outside of the tech world. In some of them, you can have a great living by being number two or number three. What we know is planning for that, particularly if you're launching something new, uh, is a grave mistake. Well, and our our big hope, Mike, is that uh, more and more entrepreneurs and innovators in the world begin adopting category design. Uh, Stanford has already begun teaching category design. And uh, we believe as more people get trained in category design, the, the, we'll see an increase in, in uptick, or said in a different way, more great innovations will find their place in the world as opposed to being left on the cutting room floor. And ultimately, that's why we decided to take this, if you will, secret black art of category design that's been practicing in Silicon Valley for a long time, and uh, if you will, give it to the world in, in this book. Great. Terrific. Well, thanks for your time. Best of luck with the book. 
Thank you so much, Mike. It's been a pleasure being with you. Christopher Lockhead is one of the authors of the book Play Bigger, and that book is out and available everywhere on Amazon, and there's a link to it on Amazon on the show notes page for this episode of the podcast at somethingyoushouldknow.net. His book is also available as an audio book from audible.com. In fact, you can get it for free if you take advantage of their offer for a free download of any audio book, including Christopher's, or any other book, plus a 30-day free trial to the service at audible.com. Just go to audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K, which stands for something you should know, so they know we're the ones who sent you there, audibletrial.com slash S-Y-S-K, and get your free audiobook and 30-day free trial to the audible.com service. Here's something pretty interesting. You've probably heard the advice all your life to just be yourself. You go on a job interview, just be yourself. You want to make a good first impression, just be yourself. Well, it turns out that if you want to appear smart and make a good first impression, you should try to think and act like a smart person would and deliberately try to make a good first impression. In other words, don't just be yourself, but be a better version of yourself, because you can always just be yourself later on. Researchers had people just be themselves, and then they had another group of people really try to act smart and really try to make a good first impression. And regardless of their IQ, those people who really tried to act smart were perceived to be smart by the people who interviewed them. So thinking to yourself, what would a smart person do or say in this situation, and then doing that turns out to be better advice than just be yourself. I'm Mike Carruthers. Thanks for listening to Something You Should Know.